I enjoy sitting watching cooking shows melting my brain just as much as the next person. But occasionally they say something that really doesn't sit well with me as a chemical engineer, and that's this. When we cook properly with alcohol, there is none in it. It's all been cooked away, okay? Gone. The question of how much ethanol boils off when we're cooking with alcohol is one that requires a couple of steps. The very final step is the maths behind batch distillation of binary mixtures. But before we even get to that, you could consider the fact that water and ethanol is an azeotrope. But before you can even start talking about those two factors, you need to understand the fundamental difference between boiling of pure substances and boiling of mixtures. And that's what we're looking at today. Today, we are talking about mixtures and we're talking about boiling. But before we talk about mixtures, let's talk about pure substances. I've shown this video a few times, but this is water boiling at sea level at 100 degrees Celsius. Once you heat a pure substance to its boiling point, its temperature stops increasing. As long as the system is open and you don't let the pressure build up, any additional heat you apply to it will cause the pure substance to boil off quicker, but it will not cause any further temperature rise. Now let's consider a mixture. Here's a mixture that a nice man in a shop prepared for me especially. This is a mixture of ethanol and water. This mixture is 40% alcohol by volume, which does not mean that it is 40 mils of ethanol to every 60 mils of water. In fact, it means it's 40 mils of ethanol to every 63 mils of water. And if you don't know why, you should really go watch my video explaining alcohol by volume. I am now heating the mixture to the boil. Note that I'm not at sea level. I actually recorded this at 1700 meters above sea level. So all boiling points are slightly lower because of a lower atmospheric pressure, about 83 kilopascals versus the regular 101 at sea level. But that's not really what this is about. When we talk about mixtures, we refer to bubble points instead of boiling points. The point of this clip is to show you that the initial bubble point of my fruit flavored ethanol water mixture is around 77 degrees. That is between the boiling points of pure ethanol at this altitude, which is around 73, and pure water at this altitude, which is around 94. The bubble point of a mixture depends on the relative amount of each component in the mixture. The more ethanol I have, the closer that initial bubble point will be to 73. The more water I have, the closer it would be to 94. This relationship is not linear. It varies greatly depending on the substances we're talking about. Now watch as I boil off more and more of the mixture. The temperature and the bubble point keep increasing. In fact, it reaches a point near the end where the bubble point of this mixture is around 94 degrees, which is pretty much the pure water boiling point at this altitude. Gone. The reason this is happening is because the proportion of ethanol to water in the vapor that boils off is greater than the proportion of ethanol to water that's in the original liquid. That means the liquid slowly becomes more and more concentrated in water. We're preferentially losing ethanol by heating this liquid. Since we just said that the bubble point of a mixture depends on the relative amount of each component, the mixture bubble point approaches the pure water boiling point. It increases. But note that even though the mixture was 40% alcohol by volume, by the time that we boiled off 40% of the liquid, we hadn't reached the pure water boiling point yet. It's not as if the ethanol boils first and the water waits in line for its turn to boil. Both substances boil off at the same time, but at different rates. So pure substance boiling points don't change, but mixture bubble points increase with time. We could plot the bubble point temperature against the fraction of ethanol remaining in the liquid phase. We usually plot it against mole percent. 
This store-bought water ethanol mixture starts at around 17 mole percent. As we boil it, the amount of ethanol in the liquid drops and the bubble point increases. This is known as a bubble point curve. Bear in mind, this is for one atmosphere, not the atmospheric pressure one finds at 1700 meters above sea level. That curve would lie lower than this one. If we did this experiment in a lab instead of my backyard, we could generate the entire curve, even for much more concentrated ethanol solutions. And it would look like this. On this curve, you have pure water and its boiling point up here, and pure ethanol with its boiling point down here. You know how I said that the vapor always has a higher proportion of ethanol than the liquid? When I started bubbling the mixture at 17 mole percent, the vapor concentration was much higher. In fact, it was above 50 mole percent. We move horizontally across because the vapor that comes off of the liquid is the same temperature as that liquid. If I captured that initial vapor that forms and condensed it, I would have alcohol that is greater than 78% alcohol by volume. It'll get you drunk! The difference in concentrations of a component between liquid and vapor is exactly what distillation is about. You add heat to a mixture and the vapor that comes off, which you can capture and condense, is richer in the lighter component compared to the original liquid you started with. We can complete this curve by capturing the vapor that comes off of our boiling liquid and measuring how much ethanol it contains. We then end up with another curve, which is called the dew point curve. Everything above this curve is a vapor and everything below it is a liquid. The envelope in the middle is a region of vapor liquid equilibrium. And generally these plots are called TXY diagrams. X is the liquid concentration, Y is the vapor concentration. T is just temperature. If the water ethanol system behaved itself, then we could generate these curves totally theoretically using something called Rolt's law. But if we did go ahead and use Rolt's law on the water ethanol system, then the curves we would get would look something like this. As you can see, it's nothing close to the actual data that's generated in the lab. If it behaved this way and followed Rolt's law, then we would say that the mixture is an ideal mixture. Water and ethanol do not form an ideal mixture. Let's look at another system. Here is the Rolt's law prediction for the vapor liquid equilibrium data for the methanol ethanol system. And here's what the actual data for methanol and ethanol look like. I've pulled this data from the Dortmund data bank. As you see, the methanol ethanol system is closer to being termed an ideal mixture. And you could maybe just get away with designing a distillation column to split these components using Rolt's law. The reason that the methanol ethanol system more closely resembles ideal behavior is because the molecules are actually quite similar structurally. Both are alcohols with these OH functional groups at the end, and ethanol is simply larger with one additional carbon along its chain. Now go and replace the methanol in this mixture with a substance like water, which looks nothing like ethanol, and you start getting really weird interactions that cause the TXY plot of the mixture to look wonky. Let's look at some others. Instead of water ethanol, let's have a look at water methanol. You can see these two behave themselves a little bit better than water ethanol, but it's still quite a bit off ideal. Just for fun, here is water and acetone. Another fan favorite that is always mentioned in lectures. When I have systems like this, I kind of need to throw Rolt's law away and use another thermodynamic model instead. For example, one could use the thermodynamic model called the non-random to liquid or NRTL model to describe the water ethanol system. The reason we use and model these curves is to describe and design distillation processes which separate and concentrate components out of mixtures. If I boil a liquid in a test tube, then the liquid composition follows the bubble point line. So if I'm trying to recover ethanol, the ethanol concentration in the liquid drops, and at the same time, the ethanol concentration in my vapor also drops. That's no good, because the vapor is supposed to be the rich stuff I'm after. But if I put my mixture into a distillation column where I have multiple stages, and the vapor from one stage goes and meets the liquid of another stage, I am able to get two separate streams, both of which become purer the more stages I have. 
one of the streams comes out the bottom of the column, which is at the higher temperature, so the higher bubble point product, in this case, water. The other, more volatile component with the lower bubble point comes out the top. That's our ethanol in this case. The problem comes into it when these two curves touch, because remember, we said the difference between X and Y is what allows us to distill. As soon as these curves touch, there's no difference. So how do you distill? This point over here is called an azeotrope, and that's what we're gonna have a look at next time. All you need to know is that if you put vodka in your distillation column, you're not getting past this point through traditional means. You're not getting vodka any more concentrated than this, no matter how tall your distillation column is. So if I were to summarize, I kind of think of chemicals as having no integrity. They act a certain way when they're on their own and they act completely different in each other's presence. Take water as an example. Water boils at 100, but in the presence of ethanol, I can have liquid water boiling at any temperature between 78 and 100. And on the other hand, ethanol, I am able to have liquid ethanol above its pure component boiling point of 78 degrees just because of the presence of water.